Hi guys, welcome back. This is Dr. Marwa and today I'll be explaining to you regarding an important topic which is relevant for the third wave of COVID-19 that's gonna hit India very soon. In this third wave, it's mainly the children who would be affected and one of the serious disease that can occur in children would be called as MIS-C that is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. I'll be explaining to you the WHO definition of this particular disease but before I do that, I would like to give you a real-time explanation with respect to a personal cases that I have experienced of this particular disease in the recent few days. One of my friends who's a non-medical, his entire family was affected by COVID. I mean, his parents, his mother was even hospitalized. But he was boasting before me that my son, who's 12 years of age, has very good immunity. And my son had fever for only 2-3 days and then he had some loss of taste and he has recovered well. But 4 weeks later, remember this occurred last month, his son had luckily recovered from COVID-19 within few days itself. His RT-PCR had turned negative, though we as doctors don't recommend RT-PCR negativity to be checked after 8th or 9th day because we know anyway the person will become negative. But a lot of these people are being you know over cautious and they are getting these tests done by themselves. So his son became RT-PCR negative and subsequently he even got antibodies checked which were present. But fast forward to currently June, his son is now having fever for past 5 days and he's asking me why is this happening. My son suffered from COVID last month and symptoms are coming of fever once again after 4 weeks. What he's also asking me is that his son is having antibodies in his blood. So there should be no such disease that can occur after four weeks well he's a non-medical so i will not be able to explain that to him but for you guys who are listening to me who are doctors i want to explain the fact that lots of time after covid 19 there might be production of non-neutralizing antibodies what i mean by these non-neutralizing antibodies is that they are not going to protect this child from the next attack of covid but what are they doing? How are they causing development of this fever? So there's a technical term which will come up in the discussion subsequently in the pathogenesis component as well that is called as antibody dependent disease enhancement. In fact, the aspect of antibody based disease enhancement is what I've discussed even in the app with respect to dengue. But at this moment, I want to explain that miss c one of the prerequisites for diagnosis will be that this particular case who's gonna be a child he should be rt pcr for sars cov 2 negative he had this infection let me say one month ago most of the time misc is developing at a distance of about or a gap of about four weeks so you would have also read the term temporal association i'll simplify whatever i have said I want you guys to remember MIS-C is a post-infectious complication of COVID-19. This patient has turned PCR negative. He definitely could be having antibodies. It could be IgG antibody against the spike protein. So this antibody levels are definitely present in variable amounts. The titer can vary. But these are antibodies which are rather causing an antibody-based disease enhancement. They are non-neutralizing antibodies. Now, this child who could be anywhere between 0 to 19 years of age, in CDC criteria, the cutoff is 21 years. In WHO that I'm discussing at the moment and MOHFW guidelines, it is up to 19 years. So I would recommend you to answer 19 as a cutoff in the government exam. If a child is having fever for more than three days with the following features that I'm going to describe before you, then you have to take into consideration the diagnosis of MIS-C. Well, to simplify, I am personally not a big fan of mnemonics because you see, ultimately, if you try to remember everything by mnemonic, by the end time, mnemonics really do not make any sense. But at this moment, as an aid to learning, because you're reading this topic for the first time, I am just creating a short mnemonic before you, MSC, you know, Master of Science, MSC, G. So let's look at the first M alphabet and focus on what are the features that would be seen. You would be having mucocutaneous inflammation present in this child. Remember, he has recovered from COVID four weeks back. Now is presenting to you with manifestations in the face like they could be cracking around the lips. They could be redness of the lips. So stomatitis could be present. Chiliitis could be present. Initially, when I say stomatitis and fissuring around the lips, you might be thinking that, sir, we have read this kind of information even with respect to Kawasaki disease. Yes, Kawasaki disease is an important differential diagnosis of MIS-C. 
So let us now look at what are the features which would be found here and would be differentiate or help you in differentiating this from Kawasaki disease. You would now be doing a throat examination of the child. So you will be able to notice a strawberry tongue. So yes, you get strawberry tongue in scarlet fever. You get a strawberry tongue in Kawasaki disease, but can also be present in Miss C. And sometimes strawberry tongue may not be present. It might actually be a strawberry pharynx as well. So shine the light properly in the throat of the patient because if the tongue is, I mean, not having that special strawberry appearance, a granular appearance, then it could be pharynx that could be involved in the patient. Another mucocutaneous manifestation that could be present is desquamation. They could be peeling of the skin and the moment I write the word desquamation, what should click in your mind is immediately another differential diagnosis, toxic shock syndrome. TSS has Nikolsky sign positive, right? The skin would just peel off. And uh, in this case also, the desquamation will mostly be occurring from the palms and from the soles. Along with this, there might be localized edema. Now, this edema component can be actually due to the disease process because inflammatory changes are occurring. So, you might get swelling in the dorsum of the hand, dorsum of the foot. But over and above this, I want you to be very particular, especially if you notice pedal edema. Why? Because these kids will also be having a myocardial involvement. And this is a real nasty myocardial infarct involvement in a sense that even coronary arteries can get involved. Just like I would say pre-COVID, in medical college, they used to ask you, tell me about rheumatic heart disease. And you guys used to start, you know, pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis. Now post-COVID, they will ask you regarding, tell me the cardiac profile post-COVID and you will start talking about what I am teaching you at the moment that is child could be having chest pain due to pericarditis component. Then there's a possibility that you might even be able to hear a murmur that is because of the valvulitis component. And last but not the least, I want to highlight that in this particular disease, even coronary artery is getting involved. Now, what is the involvement in the coronary arteries? It's mainly coronary artery inflammation and the various methods by which this coronary artery inflammation can be measured. So I will teach you regarding uh, the Z score values on the basis of which the treatment for this condition is given because the dosage of uh, I would say methyl prednisolone that you give in this condition will vary depending upon whether the Z score is more than 10 or more than 2.5 and those things will come subsequently. But do remember coronary artery inflammation could be written in Miss C literature or in a multiple choice question or you might write echocardiography findings of bright coronary arteries. Now, if you're listening to me carefully, one thing that you will notice at this particular junction is that I have not talked about any unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy, which I have always characteristically described for a patient who is suffering from Kawasaki disease. In patients of Miss C, yes, you definitely can have a stomatitis, you can have fissuring around the lips, that's standard with Kawasaki, but Kawasaki has a lymphadenopathy which has not been described here. And in fact, in some cases, there might even be presence of conjunctivitis. This conjunctivitis which is present is non-purulent conjunctivitis. So let's just recall the important features. I said when you look at the face of a child with MISC, what are you going to see? You look at the eyes, you will notice the non-purulent conjunctivitis component. You will notice the swelling around the lips or maybe the redness of the lips, fissuring around the lips. Inside the mouth, you are going to see a strawberry tongue or a strawberry pharynx. And when you do the extremity examination, the extremities might be having edema and maybe desquamation present. That's what I mean by the word presence of mucocutaneous features, but no lymphadenopathy. And when I say cardiac manifestations, with respect to cardiac manifestations in Kawasaki disease, I've already always, always highlighted coronary artery aneurysms. In fact, I've spoken about giant coronary artery aneurysms, more than one centimeter size in a little baby. But in this case, I'm talking about coronary artery inflammation. Yes, aneurysms have been demonstrated, but maybe in very limited number of cases. So it's not a coronary artery aneurysm, it's coronary artery inflammation, which can actually cause problems because the child could be having elevated levels of troponin T. Child can go into heart failure. So pro-BNP levels will be elevated. So I will be teaching you subsequently what are the investigations to be done, tier 1, tier 2 investigations to be done for this condition. But now we move on to the Another component of MSCG that is alphabet S and that is understandable because if heart will not function properly, then the person can go into shock. Now, what is the type of shock that is seen here is usually warm shock. And uh, those of you who have studied already the medicine component, please come out with the, uh, the answer in the comment box. What is the preferred drug that you use for warm shock?
you want me to give options options are standard no dopamine dobutamine uh, epinephrine nor epinephrine yes guys what drug do you use for pump shock because this shock may will not be responsive to fluids and if somebody is having myocarditis and if you give iv fluids that will be counterproductive no that will worsen the pulmonary edema component of the kid so breathlessness can be present in these children but this breathlessness will be primarily because of myocardial malfunction see in covid 19 during the acute phase of covid 19 breathlessness is because there is a pneumonia present there is ground glass opacity is present there is lung consolidation but here there is a cardiogenic component to the breathlessness that would be experienced by the patient yes guys i think i gave you sufficient time to comment on the answer the warm shock would be treated with norepinephrine so children with severe misc develop a cardiac malfunction they go into heart failure you have to check for bnp levels you have to check for troponin i levels and you have to give inotropes for these patients yes the mainstream treatment is what you already know i mean i i know that all of you know intravenous immunoglobulin steroids aspirin will be used but the specialized treatment how would you working in a intensive care unit as a intent in intensivist manage the warm shock of the scared you would be starting the kid on norepinephrine why norepinephrine i think i have explained substantially in the app guys norepinephrine increases diastolic blood pressure and if you increase diastolic blood pressure it will increase coronary blood flow if you increase coronary blood flow the malfunction of the heart will become relatively lighter because in, in this condition the main problem is the coronaries are not being able to provide sufficient amount of flow to the heart not because there is any occlusion but because of the inflammatory process they could be thrombi formation then is the coagulopathy component which is again important in the sense that uh, you could be having a deranged prothrombin time you could be having a deranged activated partial thromboplastin time and most of the parents will bother you with this child would be having elevated d dimer sa in fact uh, the case that i was discussing earlier of my friend who's a non medico and his son had covid and then he has recovered but is now suffering from misc when he came to me initially his words were like this my son has very good immunity he recovered from covid now usko fir se bukhar aa gaya hai and along with fever he is having grossly we got routine panel 10 you know because during covid everybody was getting crp d dimer so they know the name of the test so the first thing he put is a report in front of me and say sir his d dimer is spiking through the roof you know that's that's what sent the alarm bells ringing in my mind and when i evaluated the child i definitely noticed mucocutaneous manifestations in fact it is a possibility that the child may not have mucocutaneous manifestations initially the child might be having gi problems now what are the gi problems that would be anticipated in this particular case could be presence of diarrhea it could be c please be very clear what you understand by temporal association is manifestations are not occurring during acute covid all manifestations will occur after 4 weeks the range given by pgh chandigarh is 2 to 6 weeks so it can be relatively lesser and why we are worried about all this is that when it comes to peak 3 peak 3 will occur after the peak about 6 weeks of distance from the peak of uh, i would say uh, the peak 2 per se now peak 2 data has all been mis mis mismanaged by the government so we really don't know exactly when the peak uh, was obtained it's a possibility that peak might be going on at the moment because death rate is still the same no though the cases are coming down so it might be still that we have still not reached the peak because of the under reporting of one so i i personally feel that's my personal opinion that a wave 3 would be starting something in august that's when we anticipate and a query in your mind at the moment would be how much percentage of children in uh, the wave 3 will develop miss c so i'll give you the figures for that also but at the moment do remember if the child suffers from diarrhea or he suffers from abdominal pain in fact there is one case report of a child developing even appendicitis and a perforation of the abdomen so they obviously did surgery for appendicitis but now the surgeon is asking his friends and his pediatrician friends should i treat the child for misc and nobody really knows the answer because of lack of awareness of the disease let us summarize guys what i want you to remember at the moment is that for diagnosis of misc you need to remember the following parameters that is mscg first m would stand for the possibility of mucocutaneous manifestations then is myocardial involvement then is going to be development of shock not always present but yes if present bad prognosis child straight away goes into severe misc classification they could be coagulopathy and g would mean gi involvements present in the child and you don't need to have all of these 
So how many of these should be present for you to make a diagnosis? I want you to remember out of the five manifestations, two should be positive. I repeat that again, out of the important manifestations that I've explained to you, out of five manifestations, at least two should be present. So let's get this data spot on in our brain so that we don't ever mess up with it. What you have just learned is if a child in India during the COVID-19 pandemic between 0 to 19 years of age starts suffering from fever, the duration of which is more than three days. Listen to the data carefully. He should be having two out of the five features that I have explained in the previous slide. But there are some extras which you need to understand. And I'm just going to put an and and in front of them so that you are able to get the entire disease spectrum now. What I mean by and here is that you need to be having some elevated markers. Now, what are the important elevated markers that you are familiar with? That's uh, pretty straightforward. It is CRP, it is ESR and it is procalcitonin. I agree to the fact that ESR may not be so accurate and uh, uh, the remaining two will definitely do the job for you. So along with two out of five features, you also need to have laboratory evidence of elevated markers present in the child. Now, the important thing, as I said right in the beginning is that you should also be having a COVID serology report. What I imply by COVID serology report is that is PCR should be negative and the antibodies against COVID-19 should be present. As I explained to you, it is an antibody based disease enhancement present. Non-medicos will not believe what you are saying. If you tell a non-medico there is an antibody in the body of your child after COVID-19, it is causing damage. They will say, sir, kya baat karte ho? Antibody to protection ke liye hota hai. An antibody which is supposed to cause protection is causing damage. Yes, guys, that's what is happening. So you need to demonstrate a COVID serology. And the last point here would be that there would be no obvious microbiological cause present. What I mean by no obvious microbiological causes like we are a developing country or I would say a tropical country. So multiple infections like dengue can be present in our country. Now it's like June, a uh, monsoon has already come. So very soon dengue cases will start occurring, then dengue shock syndrome will occur and you as a doctor in your OPD or maybe in your casualty will have to handle dengue shock syndrome versus a severe MISC patient who is having a cardiac malfunction and is gone into left ventricular failure. So obvious uh, microbiological causes have to be ruled out. One more example apart from uh, dengue shock syndrome I can say before you is like uh, toxic shock, uh, shock syndrome. TSS occurs because of the super antigen by staph aureus that also causes an extensive desquamation and can cause a patient to go into uh, if not directly into heart failure or due to myocarditis but at least the shock component can still come up that is septic shock component. So obvious microbiological causes have to be ruled out. How would you rule that? I'm just going to explain to you because we have two set of investigations here called as tire 1 and tire 2 and they would come up in our subsequent slides. I would like to tell you that uh, cases of MISC were first reported in 2020. Uh, these are a couple of snapshots like uh, in UK, then even in France, even in United States. Every time there has been a peak of adult COVID cases, then there definitely has been a next peak. That peak could have been bigger or smaller, but the gap between the two peaks is usually in the range of about uh, two to six weeks. And that's where the pediatric cases are coming up. Uh, well, when you look at the UK data, it says that the predominant problem of the patient uh, was obviously cardiac malfunction, but uh, initially a lot of children have GI complaints. Now that is again a problem for a pediatrician because uh, if you are admitting somebody who is having severe dehydration and later on goes into heart failure, that's problematic because you had already given IV fluid correction to the patient for hypovolemic shock that could be present due to severe dehydration. So you are in a fix, you are wondering, did you give too much of fluids that is causing a fluid induced hypervolemia or was there a myocarditis component which has contributed to this. So it's definitely going to be difficult for people who are who have not seen cases or those who have not studied about MISC to fathom what is really going on. Even look at the France data, it is GI complaints and then a 100% cases having a LV malfunction. Luckily, all of these cases have recovered. Because obviously these countries have good facilities and money is not a problem for them. But in our country, to see a combination of GI complaints and then cardiac involvement simultaneously in a single case has not been heard of before. So that is why a word of caution for today. 
Similarly, in the American data, abdominal pain and left ventricular dysfunction were up 63-63%. And these are the name of the journals in which this data has been published. So I'm talking about data from uh, JAMA or from circulation or from Journal of Pediatrics. Now, a very important question that would be coming up in all of your mind is that, sir, what is going to be the incidence of MISC? I mean, how many percentage of children who have COVID positive status after four to six weeks will develop and uh, manifest MISC features? Obviously, the spectrum will be varied. It could be MISC mild, it could be moderate, it could be severe. But how many of children who are COVID positive will go on to develop this? Then the data by PGA Chandigarh is hovering in the range of 0.1 to 0.6%. So it does not look like too much, but at the same time, if you look at percentages in India, I mean, if you look at the total caseload of India uh, and 0.6% can be pretty substantial. I can just give an example, like if 1 lakh cases are being reported every day in India, even today, though we all know the data is first, if 1 lakh cases are reported every day, about 10 to 12% are pediatric cases. So 10% of 1 lakh would be approximately 10,000. I'll just put out the figures before you. If 10,000 children are having COVID positive status today, then out of this 10,000, 0.6% after four to six uh, weeks can end up with MISC. Now, if you look at the number, I mean, it may not look very great to you, but the point is when those 60 kids are going to fall sick and they're going to require management of warm shock or they're going to require cardiac care and you require a pediatric cardiologist also to come in with the peripheries not having such facilities, uh, these kids can die. And once the kids will die, media will come over and you know, you very well know all mayhem will break loose. So we as doctors need to educate ourselves about the disease and obviously the government needs to make preparations so that even at a periphery, this condition can be diagnosed and treated right away. In fact, only severe MISC cases should be admitted to tertiary care hospitals and mild cases can be managed at home. The moderate ones are obviously, uh, I would say, an area which is dicey for anybody because uh, if I'm doing private practice and if I get a kid who's having, let me say, mild to moderate Missy and tomorrow if he goes into heart failure parents can blame me so we need to have a very I would say uh, clear-cut line uh, of demarcation where we are able to identify which are the cases that will deteriorate and at the moment we do not have such very good uh, markers that can tell us so I mean we are learning on a regular basis but point is we in in the next coming months I think we will be able to draw a line and say okay these are the patients who are definitely going to deteriorate but a broad figure I've told you is like uh, out of 1 lakh cases if 10% are pediatric cases then out of those pediatric cases right I'm talking about pediatric uh, COVID positive cases here and the age group we are taking is 0 to 19 in CDC it can be taken up to 21 years of age 0.6% is upper limit that has been reported. Now, WHO case definition, once again, I have shown to you, in fact, I've described all these parameters, two out of five should be present. There should be inflammatory markers, status of COVID-19, and I want to highlight, even if somebody is uh, RT-PCR negative and antibody titer also negative, as a dekhe na bahut case, jinko COVID hua tha, par RT-PCR negative the, antibody titer bhi negative tha, they are saying, sir, abhe to COVID tha hi nahi. But problem is that if somebody has had a contact with a case of COVID, like four members in the family, husband, wife, son and daughter, husband, wife suffered from COVID, RT-PCR positive, daughter is also RT-PCR positive, son was exposed, he even had symptoms, but he is RT-PCR negative, antibody titer also negative, still he can develop MISC. How? Because the antibodies that are found are not to a sufficient titer to be detected by the routine microbiological kits. I mean, there's a possibility that non-neutralizing antibodies may not be picked up by the standard kits available. And obviously standard uh, staphylococcal or streptococcal infections have to be ruled out. Here I have shown a kid who's having this uh, desquamation which is present on the soles. And if you look at the data here, you will notice that uh, extremity changes, mucosal irritation, conjunctivitis, they are having rather, uh, they are favoring more as a diagnosis of MIS-C. And this is the reason why uh, I had started by describing mucocutaneous manifestations of the disease. I could have started with the GI complaints because you can see like in uh, uh, some of the data that we saw earlier, uh, like the French data, almost uh, the percentage of uh, abdominal pain and left ventricular dysfunction was equal. 
I agree to that, but these manifestations develop a little later. Initially, it is mucocutaneous manifestations, then it is GI complaints, and then there is a cardiac malfunction. I mean, it the it can vary. Obviously, it can vary. But my experience and what I have seen limited number of cases is initially you are having mucocutaneous features coming up. You try to pick up the disease then only. Then the child will start having diarrhea manifestations, and then obviously the worst case scenario is deterioration into severe MISC, where you will obviously have to call in a pediatric cardiologist to be able to manage the case. As far as the pathogenesis of the disease is concerned, I have specially invited uh, uh, one of the top faculties of our country, and let's now look at what he says before I describe to you the uh, tier one and the tier two investigations, and then I'll talk about the management perspective as well. Now, talking about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that is seen in case of children, even though the CDC mentions that the affected child should be having an age of less than 21 years, but the median age of the children is going to be around 10 years. We also are going to be having a temporal relationship with the peak COVID that is majority of these children are going to be becoming symptomatic after around 4 weeks of the infection. We also need to be clear of the fact that majority of these children are going to be in fact testing negative with RT-PCR. However, if you go in for serological testing of the affected child that usually comes out to be positive. Now we had the cases of MISC which were reported earliest in our country from Mumbai as early as May 2020. We had patients who were in two important subtypes. One affected group of the children who were having MISC which was without shock and the second group of affected children who were having the multisystem inflammatory syndrome with shock. Obviously the latter group required inotropic support as well in their management. Now talking about the pathogenesis of this condition. When we talk about the infection caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we have three stages of infection. The first stage is usually going to be associated with very mild symptoms or even the affected children are going to be totally asymptomatic. The second stage is associated with the pulmonary involvement which is much more dramatic, much more severe in case of adults in comparison to children. Why does that happen? Simply because the children are going to be having less expression of the ACE2. Recall that AC2 is required by the virus to enter inside the affected cells. However, what we find is that during the stage 2, there is going to be certain viral antigens which will behave as super antigens and they contribute to the macrophage activation. Additionally, we find that there can be formation of antibodies against the spike protein of the virus. So these antibodies, especially against the spike protein of the virus, are again contributing to the macrophage activation. Now macrophage activation is very important so far as the progression into the third stage which is the hyperinflammatory stage is concerned. Why do I say so is because the hyperinflammatory syndrome or the stage is the one in which the children are going to be having the manifestations. This stage is characterized by classically immune dysregulation and a release of massive amount of cytokines. Let me try to explain that. You see, once you are having the activation of the macrophages, they are also responsible for causing the stimulation of the helper T cells. These helper T cells are going to have a dual mechanism. Mechanism number one, they are responsible for causing release of massive amount of cytokines. Cytokines like interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, TNF-beta as well as interferons. And these cytokines in turn cause more recruitment of inflammatory cells like the neutrophils, thereby causing more damage. Additionally, what we find is that the helper T cells are also going to cause more conversion of the B cells into plasma cells. We all understand what will plasma cells do? Plasma cells are responsible for secretion of antibodies. So we have the stage 3 which is the hyperinflammatory response stage which is characterized by excessive formation of antibodies. Now, how are these antibodies going to contribute to the development of manifestations? Mechanism number one, these antibodies are responsible for causing an attack on every tissue in the body which is having the viral antigens. Mechanism number two, the antibodies would attack also the tissues in which the natural molecules are having a similarity with the viral antigens. So thereby the concept of molecular mimicry also plays a role over here. Third mechanism is that the antibodies are going to form a complex with the viral antigens. Remember immune complexes and these immune complexes are responsible for eliciting the inflammation at the level of different tissues in the body. So all in all what we find is that the stage 1 is going to be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic for the child. 
stage 2 or the pulmonary stage is usually going to be skipped or it is going to be absent and it is the third stage which is going to be associated with immune dysregulation and massive cytokine release which is going to be the most important contributor to the development of pathogenesis caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It is also important for us to note that the virus causing a direct injury at the level of cells is going to be a very less important mechanism. It is the antibodies which most importantly contribute to the manifestations that is seen in these children. Now talking about the laboratory derangements that are going to be seen in case of a child affected with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. These children are going to be having derangements in the laboratory test which has to be seen in association with the clinical parameters as well. If we take the blood sample of these children, there is going to be elevated neutrophil count that means neutrophilia but they are also going to be having reduced number of platelets as well as lymphocytes. So there is neutrophilia with thrombocytopenia as well as lymphopenia. This being an example of an inflammatory condition is associated with elevated levels of pro-inflammatory markers. So the affected child is going to be having elevated concentration of C-reactive protein. He is going to be having elevated concentration of serum ferritin. He is also going to be having elevated concentration of pro-calcitonin. Now this condition is also having the presence of coagulopathy which is manifested in the form of elevated levels of D-dimers and there is going to be reduced levels of fibrinogen. Even though in the definition we talk about more than two systems of the body being affected in case of a child having MISC but it is the cardiac tissue which bears the major brunt of the trouble over here. So a lot of these children are going to be having the elevated markers of cardiac tissue injury especially elevated levels of cardiac troponin. The children are going to be at higher risk of development of cardiac failure which is suggested by the elevated levels of marker like the N-terminus pro BNP which is brain natriuretic peptide. If you were to go in for investigations like echocardiography that is going to be associated with the presence of the global left ventricular hypokinesia. So these deranged laboratory parameters along with the temporal relationship of a difference of 4 weeks from the peak of COVID along with involvement of more than 2 organ systems that is what is going to be helpful in making a diagnosis of the MISC in case of children. Thank you Dr. Gupta for your kind inputs. Uh, as you can understand now all of you that this is a post-infectious complication that occurs after 4 to 6 weeks of recovery from COVID-19. This is due to antibody mediated disease enhancement, a very paradoxical phenomenon and uh, well as a physician my job is now to tell you regarding some tropical diseases that must be ruled out before you consider MISC as the final diagnosis. Well, one of the important infections to be ruled out is obviously typhoid. So you will be doing a Vidal and a blood culture. Then for Dengue, you will be doing a NS1 antigen and a Macalyza IgM, IgG antibody for Dengue. Then a blood culture for possibility of Staphylococcus super antigen induced toxic shock syndrome. IgM class of antibody for rickets here that is Cryptyphus. And uh, obviously the main crux of the discussion today will be how to differentiate between Kawasaki disease and MISC because of the overlapping mucocutaneous manifestations and the cardiac manifestations are also somewhat overlapping. So in few minutes from now, I'll be writing down and explaining to you how to differentiate between the two cases. That's what I've written here. Kawasaki disease, Kawasaki disease with shock because if there are giant coronary artery aneurysms, possibility of MI in the child is very high and the child can go into cardiogenic shock. Toxic shock syndrome obviously has to be ruled out. So because of the fact that you have to rule out differentials like tropical infections, Kawasaki disease, toxic shock, as a result of it, uh, the government of India, MOHFW, PGI Chandigarh, they have actually come up with some list of investigations which you are supposed to remember. The tier 1 investigations can be done where? They can be done at COVID care center or at a dedicated COVID health center. You will be doing a complete blood count where you will be having neutrophilia and lymphocyte count will be reduced so NLR ratios obviously will matter. Then would be complete metabolic profile that involves blood sugar, LFT, KFT including arterial blood gas analysis and electrolytes. You will notice that a lot of patients might be having hyponatremia, sodium will be less than 135 and uh, at the same time serum lactate levels can be elevated if they go into multi-organ failure. 
CRP and ESR will help you in monitoring your case because the moment you start methylprednisolone, intravenous immunoglobulins, you will notice that the values of CRP will gradually come down. And at the outset, I want to tell you that in most cases of MISC, CRP values at presentation can be more than 100. Yes, guys, much, much higher elevated values of CRP. Uh, more, I mean, values would be much, much higher than what you routinely see with other infections. Then uh, standard SARS-CoV-2 serology has to be done because that's one of the important diagnostic criteria that the person has recovered from COVID-19 and he should be PCR negative, blood culture for toxic shock syndrome. The interpretation I'll explain to you once again by writing so that this becomes a permanent memory for you. But before that, let's look at tier 2 investigations. Now, why have they made two tier of investigations is primarily because our healthcare system is pity as you know is, is in bad shape. So if you are in a periphery, you may not be having access to fancy investigations. But that will not change the course of the treatment because once you start the person on steroids and intravenous immunoglobulin and if required aspirin and oxaparin, what you need to monitor is mainly CRP and ESR only. There is no need of monitoring BNP levels or there is no need of monitoring for troponin and I values because once they're elevated, I mean, they will take their own sweet time to come down. So the message is that tier to investigations, even if they are not available, the treatment of the patient should still be done and monitoring will be based on tier one investigations only. Now, when it comes to tier two, uh, they are done at a dedicated uh, COVID hospital. You will be evaluating the patient for cardiac status. So a baseline ECG because you could be having a ST elevation or a depression. Echocardiography. Echocardiography will pick up two things for you. One, it can pick up a left ventricular dyskinesia, hypokinesia. Second, echocardiography can pick up, you, you will read this word in lot of reports, bright coronary arteries. Coronary artery aneurysms may occur but are rare. Coronary artery aneurysms are more common with Kawasaki disease. I repeat that again. In patients of MIS-C, you will mainly have the literature written bright coronary arteries and not coronary artery aneurysm, though I said plus minus may be present. Coronary artery aneurysms, especially giant ones, are more common in Kawasaki disease. Pro-BNP is B-type natriuretic peptide which would be elevated because of heart failure and cardiac troponin because obviously coronary arteries are getting involved here. The inflammatory markers like procalcitonin and ferritin definitely help in diagnosis but in follow-up well they may not be of too much of use so I mean even if you do not follow up a patient's procalcitonin levels it does not really matter. D-dimer is an important investigation because it is telling you regarding the coagulopathy component and to give credibility because lots of time you would have seen D-dimer being elevated in isolation. That's because of the laboratory error. Because of the loads of the laboratory, they collect the sample in the morning, processing is done in the evening or even the next day. So the sample is going to be stored that long. The D-dimer values can definitely be falsely elevated. I personally have had relatives where D-dimer was 2000 and patient was asymptomatic so I did not start inoxaparin and when I get the D-dimer evaluated again from a different lab and I told the lab check it right now within one hour of taking the sample it was normal. Imagine D-dimer of 2000 in a guy with you know a coronary artery risk and uh, I was wondering whether I'm doing the right thing by not starting the person on heparin but the next day's report assured me the fact that yes my thought process was right the laboratories are overworked the technicians are tired so no big deal that you can get for falsely elevated values so always get a fibrinogen values done simultaneously. Triglycerides yes can be elevated in inflammatory states get a cytokine panel this does not again change the course of treatment like if you are gonna get an interleukin 6 there's a possibility you have given methylprednisolone you have given IVIG two shots to the patient 48 hours have passed by but IL-6 is still rising so that will result in uh, you know a panic in your mind that am I treating enough they have categorically mentioned to monitor the case, it is CRP that matters and not IL-6 values. The values are anyway going to spike for a few days and then come down. So do not chase the numbers. For tropical infections like malaria, a peripheral film would be good enough. For dengue, a NS1 antigen, dengue serology, IgM for scrub typhus, Vidal and a blood culture. SARS-CoV-2 serology, as I've explained, antibodies will be there, but the person will be PCR negative. So if you get these baseline investigations done, you would be in a more comfortable state with respect to diagnosing whether this is MIS-C, whether it's a tropical infection, or whether it is going to be, uh, you know, a gray area. If it's a gray area, I want to tell you, start the patient on antibiotics, 
start the patient on antibiotics plus methylprednisolone plus intravenous immunoglobulins i think in the pandemic situation it is better to be safe than sorry because if you miss this diagnosis obviously the cardiac malfunction the coronary artery inflammation once it deteriorates beyond a certain level you will not be able to get this child back on track fortunately all over if you listen to the data whether from mamc whether from aims whether from pgh chandigarh all the experts in our hospitals have been able to pick up the cases on time and thereby the mortality rates have been very very less and that's very very encouraging in fact uh, i listened to a couple of telemedicine uh, lectures uh, of our seniors who who have i i think done a commendable job in uh, keeping the mortality uh, to a reasonably uh, lower limit than what was anticipated because when i read about this disease first time i thought it's going to be mayhem blood bath in india but hats off to these warriors who are front line warriors who have managed to keep things under control now i will explain to you what do i mean by the word positive tier 1 investigations i am going to write two points before you and both of these points should be positive when you will look at the crp report of the patient the values should be more than 5 mg per deciliter the esr of the patient though can be slightly elevated even due to wrong sampling but then anything in excess of 40 along with this is one of the important parameters that yes mis e could be present along with this whatever i say next there will be three or four points out of three or four points any of them can be present that is one is absolute lymphocyte count of the patient if is less than 1000 cells per microliter you very well know that in uh, viral infections lymphopenia can be present in the patient Uh, along with that uh, when it comes to the platelet count and listen to this point very carefully uh, you will always always notice that the platelet count will be elevated in patients of kawasaki disease but in miss c there is definitely a thrombocytopenia the values will usually be less than 1.5 lakhs per cubic millimeter along with this uh, the polymorphonuclear cell count would be elevated there could be albumin levels which could be relatively lesser sodium values will usually found to be lesser uh, probably some component of siadh present here which is resulting in a u volemic hyponatremia so these are the usual labs that you would be getting he says what do you say as a positive tier 1 investigations and both of these things should be present that is uh, a crp the cutoffs and the asr cutoffs that i mentioned plus any one of these it could be lymphopenia it could be neutropenia it could be platelet count which is relatively lesser and i highlighted about the platelet count which i'm highlighting once again platelet count is grossly elevated you get a thrombocytosis in kawasaki disease whereas you get a thrombocytopenia with respect to these patients please appreciate the fact that there is no one single investigation by which you can say it is mi mis e or not it's obviously a diagnosis of exclusion plus you need to look at all the definitions that i've highlighted so i hope you recall two out of five clinical features that has said positive laboratory features positive tier 1 investigations previous association with covid 19 and common infections to be ruled out so let us now study how would you as a doctor rule out mis c versus kawasaki and this would be a i would rate this as very important part of uh, today's uh, discussion per se so i'll use two different colors just to highlight the differences between the two when it comes to mis c Uh, this has been documented both in india as well as abroad that the mean age of presentation is about 10 years of age whereas when it comes to kawasaki disease you very well know that the patients will be relatively younger in fact most of these patients will be between 2 to 4 years of age that's the standard data that i've taught you in the app as well uh the next point is not valid for india but you will notice that misc was more common in america in blacks so a lot of anyway lots of blacks uh, in america they died because of obviously they did not have medical insurance and apart from that even african kids are more predisposed whereas when it comes to kawasaki disease it is relatively more common in asian population now initial presentation of uh, misc is most of the time along with fever abdominal pain though i have told you that there have been case reports where this abdominal pain was so bad that the subsequent uh, it was found that the patient had appendicular perforation was operated upon but this child not only underwent a appendectomy but later on was given proper treatment for misc as well because perforation has been found to be associated with misc along with this nausea vomiting diarrhea can be present which i'm not writing but when it comes to kawasaki uh well uh, these would either not be present or even if abdominal com- complaints are present in the form of abdominal pain they would be relatively less severe 
now we come to an important aspect which i want you to understand when it comes to misc there's a definitive myocarditis component coming up there is a myocardial inflammation present so therefore the cardiac biomarkers troponin t would be elevated and the patient can go into heart failure so even the bnp the b type natriuretic peptide would be elevated the coronary arteries are definitely involved in this condition the inflammation will be calculated by a z score on echocardiography most of the time in multiple choice questions to help you he might write the word bright coronaries but when it comes to kawasaki disease per se i want to remind you that the data that i've taught is uh, mainly coronary artery aneurysms uh, i want to make it clear that very few cases you know one out of maybe 50 cases or one out of 100 cases reported might have had a coronary artery aneurysm even in misc but when it comes to uh, per se kawasaki it is not one it is multiple and they are giant they are more than one centimeter see the baby is himself so small baby's heart is so small in that small heart you are having aneurysms of size more than one centimeter that is why mi occurs in kawasaki subsequently so coronary aneurysms i'm just putting plus plus to say the size of these is going to be mega they're going to be relatively bigger and well if if the heart is going to be involved there's going to be congestive heart failure then there's going to be left ventricular uh, failure contributing to kidney injury as well so acute kidney injury will be more common in misc urine output that's why they're calling it multi multi system inflammatory you know because the kidneys of the patient are shutting down whereas uh, such kind of a presentation i'm writing corresponding is rare in kawasaki disease then uh, especially for the values of uh, trop i it could be tropa, it could be troponin T, it, it really does not matter. Uh, the values of pro BNP, they will be really going through the roof. In fact, cardiac malfunction is one of the important reasons that you need a pediatric cardiologist to handle this case and that to an experienced one who can handle stuff like warm shock. Because if you load the patient with fluids, remember earlier he had diarrhea, there's a possibility that you might cause a hydrogenic deterioration of the patient. So you need a person who's highly experienced to be able to handle this. But when it comes to Kawasaki disease, the values are definitely elevated, but they're not going through the roof. Now by plus and minus here, I simply mean that trop I values can definitely be elevated in both of them. But in Kawasaki, we do not have BNP elevation so sufficiently or I would say gross elevations of BNP are not found in Kawasaki disease but gross elevations can definitely be found in uh, MISC. Then another differentiating feature I highlighted was with respect to platelet count. When it comes to MISC, the platelet count will always be lesser, thrombocytopenia. But here, in fact, I am highlighting this. Uh, I could have just said it but I'm just writing this table so that you can remember the differences here and uh, I'll be sharing the PDF of this on my telegram group or you can mail me at marvamedicine at gmail.com so I'll be glad to assist you. These are some important differences that you need to understand. Then look at uh, the markers also. Ferritin values, triglycerides, CRP, they're just going through the roof when it comes to MISC but on the contralateral side you will always notice that uh, the values are not so grossly elevated. Lymphopenia is uh, what I've already explained. Uh, lymphopenia is uh, mainly a feature that is uh, associated with the uh, post SARS-CoV-2 infectious uh, association and there is no such association which is at the moment associated with Kawasaki disease. For Kawasaki disease, we use intravenous immunoglobulins and aspirin. But on the left hand side, guys, we are even using methyl prednisolone. So that is why we are trying to differentiate. There can definitely be an overlap. We are talking about a lot of phenotypes also. But at the moment, I would like to keep th same things simple before you. When it comes to Kawasaki disease, uh, most, uh, I would say, tertiary care hospitals, pediatricians are well versed with handling Kawasaki per se. With MISC, it is just that recognition part is little more difficult that too will also be solved as more and more cases will come we will get more adapted to uh, the information with respect to the more cases that we see and uh, we will be in a better position to then you know start treatment of our patients and uh, uh, i would like to hear out the outside say if you are not comfortable and you still think it could be toxic shock syndrome please start antibiotics also that's given in the protocol of MOHFW. In fact, they very categorically mentioned start antibiotics with steroids with the IVIG if you are not comfortable with the diagnosis. Now, this is a huge table that I'm mentioning before you and I don't want to overwhelm with you the data, but toxic shock syndrome, which is seen with the super antigen of Staphylococcus aureus is uh, again a differential diagnosis, which is to be considered. Even in this, there can be GI complaints. 
even in this condition the child could be having hypotension but this would be a primarily a septic shock that the child would be developing and antibiotics would have a primary role in this case but when it comes to toxic shock syndrome there is no reports of any coronary artery involvement uh, if you read the table coronary artery dilatation or aneurysms per se if you look at this particular section in fact i'll just zoom it in for your convenience uh, you will notice that uh, coronary artery dilatation or aneurysms they are reported both for MIS-C, they are reported both for Kawasaki disease, but they are not reported at all. So, I mean, the cardiac malfunction component in echocardiography can definitely give you a wealth of information, at least for ruling out TSS before the blood culture reports would come to you. Valvular regurgitation can be found in both of them. So, don't be surprised if you read or if you find a, a, a pan-systolic murmur or mitral regurgitation developing in MISC. I will now simplify this flowchart before you, which is present uh, in MOHFW, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare website, where they have talked about uh, when do you suspect uh, a person having MISC. I've already explained that to you, unremitting fever, epidemiological link to SARS-CoV-2 and the clinical features two out of five positive that I have already explained. Now, if a person is having shock-like manifestations right at the outset, even if you are not doing investigations, treatment would start immediately. I mean, I will not wait for Tire 1 investigation report to come if shock of shock is present in the patient. In fact, uh, this is an important thing that he has said. If there's a cardiac malfunction documented, if you can pick up coronary artery involvement in the form of bright coronaries, uh, there's a multi-organ failure in the patient. If any one of these is present, investigations to hota rahega, but he says that must start antibiotics in the person. You can very well see here, he has said, if present, pending investigation, start antimicrobials along with immunoglobulins plus steroids because I know a lot of you will be initially had I not shown this slide you would have said come on sir you are giving a blind treatment antibiotics and steroids simultaneously but they've recommended this in the guidelines at the moment these guidelines will obviously change with time as we are you know more adapt and we are more comfortable diagnosing the disease but yes if the child is not in shock let me put a cross over this to say if you don't have any shock features if you don't have a cardiac failure, no need of antibiotics in this particular case because TSS will anyway cause shock, septic shock. So if there are no features of shock present in the child, like let me say he had COVID-19 last month, he is now having diarrhea, mild to moderate, no shock features, no, no, not even hypovolemic shock requiring fluid resuscitation, plus his D-dimer is grossly elevated, plus he's having chiliosis, he's having stomatitis, my diagnosis is made. What will I do in this case? I will start the kid on steroids and intravenous immunoglobulin and these should obviously be given with the, I would say, after admission and uh, these two drugs can go into sh uh, black marketing. I mean, if the chemists start listening to our discussions, no big deal, the chemists at the moment in India might be stocking these drugs. So, uh, the main treatment would be given as steroids and immunoglobulin. And then the question that comes up is, what is the role of aspirin and enoxaparin? And I mean, do you use enoxaparin in MISC? Yes. So let me explain now why and why and when would you be using aspirin. See, aspirin anyway, because coronary arteries are involved, I don't want a thrombus formation. And especially if there is a thrombocytosis present, which may not be there, but if there is a coronary artery aneurysm score of Z score more than 2.5, listen to the data very carefully, coronary artery aneurysm score more than 10 versus more than 2.5, you have to give anti-clotting agents. Coronary artery aneurysms are relatively rare, but if they are present, it means thrombus formation chances will be more. In those circumstances, whether to start aspirin, whether to start enoxaparin, whether to start both is the question that I'm getting from a lot of my friends. I'm getting uh, the, these questions from uh, my juniors. Well, the answers are here in front of you. When would you start aspirin? Base it on ECO report. Z score given more than 2.5, start aspirin. Don't chase the numbers of D-dimer. I repeat that again, don't change. Child might be having only fever with elevated D-dimer uh, SA. If only fever and D-dimer is elevated, he is a mild missy. You know, one feature is still missing. I'm saying he may be mild missy and D-dimer is very high. So don't get panicked and start aspirin. Uh, start aspirin in the patient. They have highlighted this again and again. Ch chasing numbers is not our goal, especially with respect to CRP or ESR or these parameters because they can definitely be having a false elevation. The number that you want to chase is the Z score on the coronary artery evaluation by echocardiographic better done by a pediatric cardiologist if more than 2.5 aspirin if it is more than this then both should be given enoxaparin as well as aspirin 
the main treatment or the main crux of this discussion is for both moderate and severe MISC. And these are the cases which are going to trouble you in future because you might be having patients of dengue shock syndrome post rainy season and these both children would be in shock. So that is where the question comes. How do you differentiate quickly? Because tests might be done tomorrow morning, but your clinical skills and acumen would definitely be there. I mean, with dengue shock syndrome, you can definitely get a positive uh, tourniquet test. You might have a thrombocytopenia to extremely low value. So, I mean, you can pick it up. For severe MISC guys, intravenous immunoglobulins, the dosage of uh, IV, IG is same in both moderate as well as severe. What is the difference is the dosage of methylprednisolone. For severe, it is much, much higher, 10 to 30, whereas for moderate cases, the dosage is relatively lesser. And aspirin, as I explained to you, will low dose aspirin. Why? Because you just want to, you know, control the, the inflammation in the coronary arteries of the patient. But anticoagulation uh, specially is to be given when the Z score of the patient is dramatically increased. And uh, well, most cases would be having a coronary artery inflammation, bright coronary arteries are written. And even if Z score is not mentioned per se, you can still start aspirin in the patient that was another query i got like the report says uh, bright coronary arteries no z score given what should i do yeah start aspirin with the standard treatment and you definitely will be getting a gratifying response now this is another interesting table uh, uh, i know you would be saying sir humne to diarrhea mein mild moderate severe pada ab ek aur classification a gayi mild miss c moderate and severe miss c so this is at the moment a primitive classification and there might be modifications in this moderate or severe mein hospitalization zaruri hai aapko patient ko admit karke intravenous immunoglobulins methylprednisolone ki dose maine batayi moderate or severe mein different rahegi aspirin dena hai inoxaparin if there is a giant coronary artery aneurysm jo gray area yahan maine mark kiya na wo problematic issue hai that mild missi mein kya karenge mild missi is like nobody's baby kyunki usko agar aap general practitioner ke paas bhejte ho mere jaise gp ke paas bhejte ho main bolunga sir agar ye deteriorate kar gaya to कल को मेरा नाम लगा देंगे फैमिली मेंबर की सर आपने बताया होता तो हमने एडमिट करा लिया होता सो so, ये जो माइल्ड मिस है ना दिस इज आई पर्सनली फील इज द मोस्ट डिफिकल्ट चैलेंज एट द मोमेंट आई मीन इंटेंसिविस्ट विल ऑब्वियसली डिफर एट माय माय ओपिनियन वो बोलेंगे सर वी आर सेविंग सिवियर मिस सी वी आर दंस हुर हैंडलिंग स्ट्रेस बट जो स्ट्रेस ये वाला है ना कि माइल्ड डिटरिएटिंग इन दिस इसके लिए वी आर नॉट हैविंग अ मार्कर एट द मूवमेंट एंड दैट इज प्रॉब्लमैटिक बिकॉज पेरेंट्स विल गो साइकोटिक द मूवमेंट दे लर्न दैट द चाइल्ड इज हैविंग कॉर्नरी आर्टरी इन्फ्लेमेशन और उसको कभी भी कार्डियक फेलियर हो सकता है एंड देर इज नथिंग दैट कैन प्रिवेंट इट इट्स ओनली द ट्रीटमेंट सो दैट्स द ग्रे एरिया बट आई थिंक विद लर्निंग ऑफ ऑल दीज फैक्ट्स विल बी इन अ मच मोर कम्फर्टेबल सिचुएशन मतलब के डी को ट्रीट करना कोई इशू नहीं है मॉडरेट और सिवियर का इलाज हमें आता है वेन इट कम्स टू माइल्ड दैट्स लाइक अ नो बट इज बेबी आई सेट एट द मूवमेंट बिकॉज of the fact that they can deteriorate and there is no way we can pick it up so i hope with the future uh, inputs coming up and uh, research studies coming up our esteemed seniors and these publications will be able to guide us uh, further uh, thank you so much for listening to me and i do not have any financial disclosures to make nowadays it's important to say so this video is not a sponsored video i have not uh, taken any grants from any company i don't take my channel is totally free and it's only for dissemination of medical information so a couple of people had actually put up comments regarding that you were promoting certain drugs no sir i'm not promoting any drug i am promoting what is good for mankind i am promoting what is good for uh, i would say betterment of everybody not only that i want to teach doctors or i am interacting with doctors even for laymen if you are listening to me this is not a commercial lecture this is not a commercial discussion and yeah please do not use this for diagnosis of your child main hath jodta hu aap please apne pediatrician ke paas jaiye wo pediatrician aapka diagnosis karenge main youtube pe diagnosis nahi hota hai यूट्यूब पे इंफॉर्मेशन होती है जिससे आपको थोड़ा सा आइडिया लग जाता है कि बच्चे के साथ क्या हो रहा है अदरवाइज ये दिस डिस्कशन डज नॉट अंडर एनी वे रिप्रेजेंट अ प्रोफेशनल ओपिनियन ऑफ अ डॉक्टर की आपने मेरी बातें सुनी और बोला मेरे बच्चे को एम आई है गूगल को और यूट्यूब को डायग्नोसिस के लिए इस्तेमाल ना करिए थैंक यू सो मच फॉर योर पेशेंस गाइज एंड आई सी यू अगेन विद एनदर डिस्कशन वेरी सुन एंड या प्लीज फॉर मैल्टी सब्सक्राइब टू द चैनल थैंक्स